If you see an ad like this, you should report it to the police. In 2011, a man named Scott Davis saw an ad for a job on Craigslist that paid $300 a week and a place to live to watch over a secluded farm in southeastern Ohio. He immediately responded to the ad and eventually he got a call back telling him he was one of the job finalists. The final interview was conducted at a local restaurant and after everything was going well, Davis agreed to climb into the back of the white Buick while his new employer Jack and his nephew drove them to the farm. They eventually came to a stop on a secluded dirt road and Jack told Davis that they left some equipment just down the hill and asked Davis to help them carry it up to the car. Jack led the way but Davis found it oddly uncomfortable that he was walking with Jack and the young man right behind him. Suddenly, Davis heard the click sound of a gun hammer and quickly turned towards the sound. A bullet shattered his elbow and Davis quickly escaped into the woods. Long after sunset, Davis finally found his way to a rural house where he pleaded with the owners to call the police. Turns out, Jack was actually a man named Richard Beasley and he used Craigslist to lure three men into the woods and kill them with his nephew. Can you imagine thinking that you found your son who's been missing for three years and then having him come live with you only to find out that not only is he not your son, but he's a 23 year old French man and a serial imposter? This is the unsolved disappearance of Nicholas Barclay. On June 13th, 1994, 13 year old Nicholas went to play basketball with his friends in San Antonio, Texas. When he was done, he called home wanting his mom to come and pick him up. However, she was sleeping and Nicholas's older brother, Jason, refused to go and get him and told him to walk. Sadly, this was the last time anyone heard from Nicholas again. Authorities initially thought that Nicholas left on his own accord, and that was mainly because Nicholas was a troubled kid, having a juvenile criminal record with charges of breaking and entering, stealing, and truancy. That, along with his mother's claims that he was oftentimes violent towards her and would sometimes run away, but was never gone for more than a day. He also had a court date one day after his disappearance, with the possibility of going to a group home. With no trace of Nicholas, his case went cold. That is until three years later, on October 7th, 1997, when Nicholas's sister Carrie receives a phone call that Nicholas has been found in Spain after escaping a pedophile ring. So Carrie flies out to Spain and positively IDs this person as her brother, even though this person has brown eyes, not blue like Nicholas's, and a French accent. The person identified as Nicholas was very nervous, wore a lot of clothes, and was very covered up. The two fly back home, and Nicholas's family welcomes him in open arms. All but a few people in the family were convinced. This was Nicholas. This person recounted all of the abuse he went through, saying that he was forced to speak French and that experiments were conducted on him, including a solution that was put into his eyes, which is why they are now brown and not blue. The FBI, a private investigator, and a psychiatrist were brought in and quickly worried that this person was not Nicholas. Expressing their concerns of how different Nicholas and this person looked, along with the fact that it was impossible for a child raised in the U.S. by English-speaking parents to not be able to speak without a foreign accent, the family simply ignored them. Nicholas's mom even refused to take a DNA test to confirm if this person was actually him. But in 1998, the FBI got a court order to take fingerprints and a blood sample and identified this person as Frederick Bourdain, a 23-year-old French serial imposter. Frederick was wanted in France for assuming 500 different identities. Frederick pleaded guilty to passport fraud and perjury, admitting that he posed as Nicholas after getting his information from a missing child center and was sentenced to six years in prison. After his sentence, he was deported to France, and just three months later attempted to steal the identity of missing six-year-old Leo Bally. Since then, Nicholas's family has been investigated for the possible involvement in his disappearance, specifically his older brother Jason, who was reportedly addicted to hard drugs and had a violent temper. Sadly, Jason passed away in 1998 due to a drug overdose, and once again, Nicholas's case went cold. It has now been 27 years, and Nicholas's disappearance remains unsolved. Hey guys! Are you guys interested in buying Yusuf some artsy merch? If you go click the link in the description box now, you will be able to get some awesome discounts from 15% up to 50% off. They offer you free shipping as well. So, what are you waiting for? Link in the description. 24 years ago, on April 7, 1997, the Little Lud family were ambushed, carjacked, and left for dead. Only one survived. Their attackers were six people between the ages of 14 and 20 years old. Natasha Cornett, 18. Karen Howell, 17. Joseph Risner, 20. Jason Bryant, 14. Edward Dean Mullins, 19. And Crystal Sturgill, 18.
It wasn't long after the group left Pikeville, Kentucky, heading down to New Orleans, that they realized that Risner's beat up old car wasn't going to make it. And they initially discussed stealing a car from a dealership or from a parking lot. The group met the Little Lud family at a rest stop on Interstate 81 outside of Bailington, Tennessee. The Little Lud family were leaving a Jehovah Witness retreat, and so they welcomed talking to strangers on the highway. Unfortunately for them, Risner pulled his weapon. And he said, I hate to do you this way, but we are going to have to take you with us for your van. He then directed Father Vidar to the van, and Vidar begged him, please, just leave us. You can take the car. He offered his keys, his wallet, everything, but Risner refused. Vidar Lilith got into the front seat of the car, and Risner sat in the passenger seat. Risner, Bryant, Hal, and Cornette were in the van with the Lilith's, and then Mullins and Sturgill followed in Risner's old car. Their mother, Delphina, tried to calm the children by singing, and she was ordered to stop. And then the family was directed to a secluded road called Payne Hollow Lane, right here. The family were lined up against a ditch along the road where they were each shot. Then Brian checked their bodies and said, they're still f alive, and they were shot again. The little leads were left for dead. The group abandoned Risner's car at the crime scene, and then, instead of heading down to New Orleans, decided they were going to go to Mexico. They snuck over the border to Mexico because they couldn't get in legally. Somehow the 14-year-old got shot in Mexico and Mexican police ended up demanding that they go back to the U.S. and they got put in Arizona prison. Vidal was shot six times, Delfina was shot eight times, and Tabitha was shot once in the head. Both parents died at the scene, but Tabitha was taken to a hospital and she died there. Their two-year-old son, Peter, was shot twice and he survived. When the group were questioned, everyone had someone else they pointed the finger to. The district attorney wanted to push for the death penalty, but he couldn't prove that all of them had been shooters, only Bryant. So he said if they all agreed to plea to first degree murder, then he would take the death penalty off the table. In March of 1998, all six signed and they were convicted of felony murder and given life in prison. As for our survivor, Peter, he grew up in Stockholm, Sweden with his aunt and remembers absolutely nothing, thank God. He lost an eye and he does struggle to walk, but in 2017, he finished his college education. Her parents came running in the room, and what they saw was shocking. The little puppy Dee Dee came bounding out of the closet, happy to see people again, but inside, slumped over, still in the clothes that she had disappeared in, was the body of little Mary Jane. There were no signs of assault. Her clothes were not disheveled. And when they inspected the closet, what they found is that while the outside was not locked, the inside of the door had a thumb lock, which was very tight, and it was actually difficult for even adults to unlock it. So poor little Mary Jane was completely unable to get herself out of the closet. There were scratches and scuffs on the back of the door where she had tried to free herself. In her autopsy, it was discovered that she had not eaten or drank anything since her death. So it was determined that she died of dehydration, starvation, and shock or fright. The autopsy also determined that Mary Jane probably died on her fourth birthday. Because the puppy seemed completely healthy, they needed to determine if somebody had actually been feeding the dog and not feeding the little girl. And so unfortunately, they euthanized this puppy in order to examine the contents of its stomach. So yeah, this puppy lived through an incredibly traumatic experience only to be put down. There was only one piece of slightly good news at the end of the story, and that's poor little Maria, who lost her puppy Dee Dee, was given a new puppy. Not that that makes up for anything. They found nothing in the puppy's stomach to explain why it was surviving so well. However, scientists now believe that it was probably because puppies often eat their own fecal matter and waste in order to gain nutrients from it. And because there was no fecal matter in the closet, it's believed that's how the puppy survived. This story is incredibly upsetting on so many levels, but one of the things that bothers me most is that the house that Mary Jane was in was searched several times. At least seven different people admit to having gone in the house and searching, but all of them say they never bothered to look in that closet. A repairman had also gone in the house the day after Mary Jane went missing and went into the basement to fix something, and again, he never heard anything. Why didn't Mary Jane call out and why wasn't the puppy barking and making a noise? While the rest of the story is pretty straightforward, 
this is a mystery that we'll just never have the answer to. Because of this, Mayor Cornelius Devenel ordered that all closets being built in the city needed to have special easy open knobs from the inside and the outside so this could never happen to another child. Mary Jane was remembered fondly by her neighbors as a tomboy who loved climbing trees and loved dogs and would often introduce herself as, Hi, I'm Mary Jane Barker. I'm from Belmar, New Jersey. What's your puppy's name? This is Synthony Vigil. She was kidnapped and held captive for three days in 1999 by the Toy Box Killer. The Toy Box Killer kidnapped and tortured her as well as 60 other women that we know about. However, Cynthia is one out of just three survivors and she is the last known victim of the Toy Box Killer. She was held with no food, no water, and was assaulted many, many times every day. The horrors he inflicted on her are unimaginable, and every single photo that I tried to find of his toy box, I couldn't show on TikTok because of some of the instruments he would use. Cynthia only escaped because the toy box killer's wife was distracted on the phone. When she came back in the room, Cynthia hit her in the head with a lamp. Cynthia was able to run out of the trailer wearing only a dog collar and chains and alerted the police. David Parker Ray, the toy box killer, as well as his wife, Cindy Hendy, were both arrested and sentenced. This is Noor, the girl whose boyfriend chopped off her head just because she wanted to break up with him. This is the murderer with his parents, rich, spoiled, entitled brat. This is Noor and her murderer boyfriend at his brother's wedding this past deck 2020. Hey guys! Are you guys interested in buying Yusulf some artsy merch? If you go click the link in the description box now, you will be able to get some awesome discounts from 15% up to 50% off. They offer you free shipping as well. So, what are you waiting for? Link in the description. Jeffrey Dahmer, one of the most notorious serial killers of modern history. After being sentenced to 16 life sentences, he was sent to a maximum security prison. His first year, he seemed to be on a path to redemption. He was even baptized and became a born-again Christian, but one of his inmates proved to be his demise. The first attack came from a fellow prisoner who tried to slash his neck, but he survived. A few months later, Dahmer was found bloody on the bathroom floor. He suffered multiple blows to the head from a metal bar, and he died in the hospital later that day. The attacker was another prisoner, and according to New York Post, the killer said that he killed him because of the persona he played to make everyone fear him. It's time for Cookies and Crime. This is the story of Vera Renzi, a woman with many lovers, and her lovers, well, she would be their last. Vera was born in Bucharest, Romania, 1903, and at the age of 15, started having a lot of behavioral issues. She was constantly running away with her boyfriends, and many of them were way older than her. Vera was described as having almost a pathological desire for male companionship. She was also very jealous and always suspicious. Before she turned 20, Vera married her first husband, a wealthy Austrian banker named Karl Schick. They also had a son named Lorenzo. Vera would be left at home while her husband was working long hours, so she became suspicious that he was being unfaithful. Without any strong evidence, Vera, in a jealous rage, poisoned her husband's dinner wine with arsenic. She told her family and friends that Carl had abandoned her and their son, and claimed that a year later, she got word that he had died in a car accident. She soon remarried a man closer to her age this time. But again, their marriage was very difficult and Vera suspected her husband of being unfaithful. After only being married for a few months, her husband disappeared. She claimed again to her family and friends that he had abandoned her. And a year later, she received a letter saying that he had intentions of leaving her forever. Vera never married again, but continued to date around, some relationships with married men. And like clockwork, they began disappearing, some months, weeks, and even days after meeting her. Anytime she was questioned about their whereabouts, she claimed that they were unfaithful and abandoned her. Her last lover and victim would be a bank officer named Melorid. 
Malorit's wife reported the disappearance to the police, but they ignored her. She did her own investigating and discovered that her husband had a mistress. She took that information to the police and two inspectors went to question Vera. Vera admitted to the affair, but claimed he had left her. The police were so blinded by her beauty and the way she held herself that they abandoned their search. Malorit's wife was obviously upset and went back to the police. She reminded them that Vera's husband and son were missing and no one knows the whereabouts of all of her lovers. So the police went back to question her again. This time, Vera denied ever having an affair with Malorid. But the police had evidence, so they searched her home. They discovered a locked underground cellar. In that cellar were 35 coffins. In the middle of the cellar was a large red armchair, a church candle, and an empty bottle of champagne. She told the police that these were the bodies of her deceased family members, but when they opened it up, they found the bodies of all the men that had been missing. She confessed to poisoning all of the men with arsenic because she believed that they were unfaithful or their interest in her was fading. She would sit in that red armchair, sip champagne, and take in the view of all the men she murdered. At the time, Yugoslavia didn't execute women, so she was sentenced to life in prison. This is Terry Jo Duperalt. And in 1961, she survived three and a half days on the open water after her entire family was murdered. Her father, Arthur, was an optometrist and he had a dream of taking the family onto a boat for a year. But he wasn't entirely sure that his family would like being on the boat for that long. So he decided he was going to charter a boat from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, all the way to the Bahamas. And if it worked, then they would do it for a year. On the boat were Arthur and Jean Duperault, their 14-year-old son, Brian, 11-year-old daughter, Terry Jo, and 7-year-old daughter, Renee, along with the Captain Julian Harvey and his wife. Her name was Mary Dean Jordan, and they'd only been married for three months. That's important to this story because unbeknownst to everyone else on the ship, Julian Harvey was going to kill his wife because he had taken on a life insurance policy on her, and it had an indemnity clause that gave him double the money if she died and it was an accident. It's believed that Harvey didn't actually intend to kill the Duperault family, but he had no choice after they heard him murder his wife. That's all speculation because we only have Terry Joe's account, which is on November 12th, 1961. At about 9 p.m., she was woken up by her brother yelling, help, daddy, help. And originally, she stayed in her bunk bed because she was super scared. Then finally, she mustered up enough courage to walk to the main cabin, and she saw the bodies of her mother and brother on the ground. When she walked upstairs to the top deck, she discovered more blood and saw a knife. Harvey yelled at her to get back downstairs, and so she did because she was afraid. But she realized that the cabin was starting to flood, so she came back up. Harvey told her that the ship was sinking, and he handed her the little dinghy boat that had her little sister's body in it. Terry was in shock, and she ended up letting the little dinghy go, and Harvey jumped into the water to go after the dinghy, and that was the last time she saw him. Terry Joe remembered that there was a cork float on the boat, and so she untied it, hopped on it, and the ship sank. She was there for hours and then days. The material at the bottom of the cork float began to disintegrate, and so her legs sat in the water, and she got bit by parrotfish on her feet and legs. After the third night, she was dehydrated and delusional. And then on November 16, 1961, a sailor on a Greek freighter noticed a tiny speck of white on the water, in the distance and when the ship pulled up he snapped this picture on the left these photos appeared all over the world in a stroke of irony harvey was at the police station when the call came in that a little girl had been found on the water he was reporting that his boat had sank with a family in it he told the police why that's wonderful when he found out that terry joe had survived and then he ran away to a hotel in miami where he took his own life because of this rescue they changed the color of life vest to help find people faster Part three on how I hid my pregnancy for seven months. So Jaden completely left me and there I was just, just pregnant. And my plan was to wait till I had a baby and just toss it in the trash somewhere, honestly. And I know this sounds crazy, but at the time I was stressed, very delusional and depressed. I thought if I told him I was pregnant, I would ruin his life. And plus he'd be mad at me because I didn't get the abortion. And also I started thinking like, even if I did want to tell him, I couldn't because he blocked me. So to hide my pregnancy, I would wear baggier clothes. When I was around people, I would sit down and I didn't want to stand up because I didn't want people to see my stomach protruding out. I wouldn't go out anywhere and the only time I came out was to get food and go to the bathroom. 
I wasn't going to the doctors, taking any medication. I was just dealing with whatever pain the pregnancy was putting me through. Also, during this time, Jaden got a new girlfriend and was posting her. And I was so sad because I was here alone, holding a baby that he didn't want. At times, I felt the S word. Part four will be up next. Crystal Smith, which is Aiden Fucci's mom, has recently been arrested for tampering with evidence. Now, during Aiden's interrogation, Crystal Smith, his mother, was in the room during this process. And during that interrogation, detectives asked Aiden Fucci if he was sure that what he was wearing the night of Tristan's murder was clean. And Aiden responded, I'm pretty sure why. And after the detectives had left the room, Crystal Smith, Aiden's mother, had leaned into Aiden and whispered with a questioning look on her face, blood? There is video evidence that was captured of Crystal Smith going into Aiden's room, grabbing the pair of jeans that he was wearing the night of Tristan Bailey's murder. She then takes the jeans to her bathroom and she rinses and cleans the jeans for a few moments in the bathroom sink. Afterwards, she takes the jeans back into the room and then she has a friend in the room with her and it looks like they're inspecting the jeans for a few moments before Crystal puts them back into Aiden's drawer. Police immediately arrested Crystal Smith and she is being charged with tampering with evidence in the Tristan Bailey case. Now the sink that Crystal washed Aiden's jeans in was being tested for blood and it did come back positive for Tristan Bailey's blood. There are shocking details coming out about this case every day. So like and follow my page for all the newest updates.